Welcome to the forecast. We are the Org, and our purpose is to assimilate seasons two to seven of Star Trek: The Next Generation. Hello, friend. Hello. And welcome to the latest forecast. And we had some feedback from our last episode. Oh, and it concerns uh, Wolf's Mockbra classes. Oh, right. I shall hand us over to Mr. Dave Jackler of the Inside Outcast. Roll! Hi, Peter. Hi, Anne Marie. This is Dave from over at the Inside Outcast with some long overdue feedback, I suppose. I'm sending my thoughts because Peter mentioned something about Worf instructing Mach Bara and Next Generation's approach to this Klingon martial art I find somewhat baffling because if you look at the postures that Worf is performing, he's essentially doing Tai Chi Chuan. Now, the philosophy behind Tai Chi Chuan Chuan seems very counterintuitive to Klingon culture. Tai Chi Chuan, which means Grand Ultimate Fist, is extremely philosophical and has very deep roots in Taoist philosophy. And I know Worf says that it clears the mind, but it goes beyond that. There are many ways to classify Kung Fu, but one of the ways is dividing between animal styles of Kung Fu that embrace the passions, and this could include monkey, tiger, crane, snake, and so on. There's human forms of Kung Fu that utilize one's reason, and these are largely army styles. And then there are spiritual forms of Kung Fu, where Tai Chi Chuan fits in. And the spiritual form of Kung Fu is all about suppressing the passions and opening yourself to the Tao so that your responses are extremely natural. The problem is it takes years to master a spiritual form of Kung Fu. As much time must be devoted to meditation and perfecting the postures and so on. The animal styles seem far more conducive to Klingons, as they are aggressive, external, hard, especially the southern styles for Klingons, as kicks are uncommon and close-quarter combat or small circle fighting is preferred. Something like Phoenix Eye or Shorthand Kung Fu spring to mind. Even more fitting for Klingons would be the Israeli martial art Krav Maga. Krav Maga is all about realistic effectiveness in real combat. It adopts the most practical self-defense methods from across many different schools of martial arts. From Jiu-Jitsu to Wing Chun to Muay Thai kickboxing and even just practical wrestling and boxing. Because Klingons are such a warlike race, you would think that their combat methodology would be more about absolute effectiveness in hand-to-hand -hand combat than attaining some spiritual plane of existence. Tai Chi seems far more fitting to Vulcans or similar more rational philosophical races. What's most striking though is if you are a Tai Chi practitioner and it is the most widely practiced martial art in the world then the postures wharf strikes become immediately recognizable. And it kind of takes you out of the show because you see it and you go, that's Tai Chi. Why is this distant race practicing this several hundred year old Chinese martial art? And it's odd that this topic should come up because we at the Inside Outcast, possibly by the time this airs, have recorded an episode on Kung Fu, and so this is very much in mind at the moment. But I suppose that's all for me. Love the boardcast. Love you guys. You're some of my favorite people in the world. You're very purple and shiny. Bye!
Bye. Bye. Oh. Thank you for saying we're purple and shiny. <laughs> I's happy now. Uh, the way to Amory's heart. <laughs> <laughs> No, yes. Tai Chi sounds very Jedi to me. Mm. And I can see, I can completely see where you're coming from. Klingons aren't Jedi. Unless, and here's my thought. All right. Is this a Tai Chi-like martial art, something that Worf has learnt in order to cope with being in the Federation and not being able to let his emotions off the handle? Is this, a way, of, is this a way of him reigning in his emotions and... Calming himself. Mm. Has, has Worf learnt Tai Chi yeah. as a Klingon living among humans? Mm. Just ah. a thought? Just a thought? No, that is, that is an interesting concept. I like that idea. Well, thank you, Dave. And, no, thank and you. Inside our cast, as, as well as covering Kung Fu, covers all sorts of things. Uh, yeah. The, the, one of the wonders of that cast is the, the sheer eclectic uh, collection of subjects that they'll cover. You never quite know from... Week to week, so um, thoroughly no. recommended. And it's worth listening to their reviews of stuff, particularly if you live in the UK, because they're obviously they're li- they're reviewing American stuff, and sometimes we then get it over here, and it gives us a, a heads up into cool stuff coming our way. Mm. We got into Chuck as a result of listening mm. to the Inside Out cast. So Indeed. thank you, thank you, Dave, and hi to Brandy. Hello, Brandy. <laughs> now we've had some some written feedback as well, right? Uh, arising from the previous podcast, I think. It's from somebody calling himself Captain Feng Shui. All oh, right. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Captain. <laughs> Hello, Captain. Should, should we salute? I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure. Not sure whether Captain Feng Shui is male or female. He or she says, I'm glad the techno babble, followed by a present day metaphor, has been mentioned. Is this the first time it happens? I recall it happening a lot, usually said by Riker at a briefing. Geordie or Data would say something like, and quote, we think we can release this substance from a containment field to neutralise the chemical reaction, unquote. And Roker would say, you mean like pour a, pouring a bucket of water onto a fire? I also remember Scotty visiting the ship later and Geordie recounting the story to him. Scotty guesses at the solution and the metaphor, and right now it makes me feel a bit of sympathetic lameness. <laughs> Yes, and uh, as Captain Feng Shui pointed out in a later conversation we had, our second episode this evening has a, an almighty big case of this particular trope in it as well. So, yes, you do trip over it a lot. Yeah. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Very true, and thank you for the kind words. OK, shall we get stuck into first contact? In his nightmares, he can see them. In his mind, he can hear them. Look, Judas. In his soul, he can feel them. I just received a report from Deep Space Five. Long range sensors have picked up. Yes, I know. The war. Not that one! Stranded on an alien planet. We have captured one of their spies. A case of mistaken identity endangers Riker's life. I have to get back on my ship. And survival lies in the hands of the enemy. Stop him! He's escaping! Will you release my officer? We're not giving him back. I believe that Riker will not survive the day. Starfleet Crisis on Star Trek The Next Generation. Well, for a change, I think the action pack music is justified. <laughs> yeah, but it one. says need help from the enemy... They aren't the enemy. Well, not really, are they? But No. At least it doesn't drop any spoilers. It just misdirects true. you somewhat. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, okay, you start off with what I think is a really good teaser. Oh, it's an awesome teaser, yes. Which is, you can vaguely see someone, but you can't see who it is, going into some sort of medical facility. Mm-hmm. And all the people are aliens, and they're all the same species. And they've got these, like, head ridges and bad hair and squished thumbs and no fingers, which makes me wonder how they manage fine motor skills. But anyway, and they're talking about someone who's injured and it, it actually reminded me a bit of Doctor Who. In the same way as with Doctor Who, they go, hang on a minute, he's got two hearts. In this case, they're going, hang on a minute, his, his cardio organs aren't where they should be. What, you mean they're in these digestive tracts? And it just seems sort mm. of similar to when they discover the Doctor... And then you look and it's Riker and he's got a massive black eye and he's clearly unconscious. Mm -hmm. And I just think that is a really good teaser. Yep, it's an excellent teaser. It's not what you expect at all. No. Um, This is a particular uh, 
it was a serious rule that they they never showed things from the alien side of view. It was always from the Starfleet point of view, and so they're breaking yeah. their rule with this one. But because they they've never done it before, and it's not something they do either again or regularly again anyway, um, it it has a lot more impact as a result. It and does. I love the fact that. Yeah, you know, the technology is obviously different to Federation technology. It's also big, bulky monitors, yeah. and the, the the doors are proper doors rather than yeah. sh- sh- for a chain. Yeah. So it's kind of nice, really. It is. It looks different. But it's interesting because, um, as you find out later, they are developing warp technology, which means their technology is superior to ours currently. Mm. And although it does look different from Federation technology, it does look superior to ours. Yeah, Currently, I, yeah. I think they've got the balance right on that one, mm-hmm. which I liked. And yeah, they wonder what on earth he is. They lift up his feet and they talk about the fact he's got digits. Then they pull his gloves off, or obviously he's made. They've made, he's tried to make himself look like he's got Zoidberg claws, um, <laughs> but he hasn't. And, and and they're like, "What are you?" And then they try to interrogate him, and he's trying to stick to his story. And all kudos for him being barely conscious, remembering what his alias is. He's like, no, I've got no family. I come from the southern continent. I'm just a tourist. And they bring out a phase when he goes, it's just a toy. And each time they're pointing it round the room, going, it's just a toy. And my heart's in my mouth well, going, no, one don't point, shoot well, one, of the, one of the doctors does, does the, you know, the hose pipe thing of looking down the barrel yeah. of the face. And you think, oh, that's not going to end well. <laughs> no. And he says it's a child's toy for a neighbour's child. It's it's a good story, but there there are a few stupid things in it, and the phaser is one of them. Why the hell would you take a phaser with you on this mission? Well, have they not got the keychain ones yet? Yeah, well, no, they've had them since the start. One of the mini ones, or at least it looks less like a gun. Yes. Now, if it had been that, you could just about justify. But even so, they're leaving behind high tech stuff. Surely, if they're going to do these covert operations, they can't take their technology with them. No. It's just stupid. Other Asking for trouble. Other than their combat. Yeah, which well, the combat isn't going to hurt anyone, isn't is offensive, it? is it? No, and probably wouldn't make much sense. But taking a phaser, particularly a phaser that looks like a phaser, yeah. you know, like a gun. It looks Dun. like a weapon. The the little keyring style ones look less like a, like a weapon. Mm. So if he has to have a weapon because of some sort of protocol, yeah, then take that one and hide it up his ass. Mind you, they probably would have discovered. Sorry, <laughs> suppository phaser. Oh! <laughs> Guaranteed clear system oh, <laughs> on brown setting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we that's what they're called now. By the way, suppository phases. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they are nice and smooth <laughs> for ease of passage. Oh, just don't Edit. squeeze your cheeks together. Oh, <laughs> holding your trousers guaranteed or worse. <laughs> Shall we move on? Yes. Let's. You're introduced to a number of key players in their society. You've got Crowler, who I kept writing in my notes as Cola, who is, he's a baddie. He's got bad glasses and a well, moustache. Well, no, he's not a, a baddie. He's, he's too broad stroke, isn't it? Because he's, he's the Minister of Security, so naturally he's the sort of person... But you see, I gonna... still can't work out whether he's supposed to remind me of someone, as in they've no. designed the makeup this way, or he's reminding me of someone. Everything about him, the way they've designed the look of the character, screams introverted paranoid pen pusher (laughs) and then you've also got the i can't remember what he's called i think it might be chancellor but it's kind of the equivalent of prime equivalent of prime minister Mm. who's fairly reasonable and then you've got the scientist marasta yale Mm -hmm. who if memory serves was a ccg card Mm -hmm. and she's developing warp technology and you've got conversations about the social reforms and the economic reforms that the Chancellor has overseen and how these space flights are going to draw attention. Marasta Yale was played by Caroline Seymour, who uh, has already appeared in... This is her second track appearance. All right. She was a, a Romulan commander in Contagion, which is one where they get that virus from the Iconian Oh, yes. Thing. Yeah. And she'll crop up as another Romulan in Face of the Enemy. Ah. But she's got quite a track record when it comes to sci-fi. Oh, and right. Genre stuff. Uh, she was in Terry Nation Survivors way back when. That. Uh, Space 1999. Babylon 5. Oh, yes. She's Senator Crosby in that. Quantum Leap. And she does voices for Mass Effect and some of the Star Wars games as well. Oh. It's just amazing. She's never been in Doctor Who, really. <laughs> it's about yeah. the one thing she hasn't done. Yeah. <laughs> but there we go, yes. So having been introduced to these characters you see more of Marastarelle in her yab in her labs pushing buttons 
quite how she manages it with those four fingers all joined together. Presumably she's using her thumbs. And then Picard and Troy beam down. And it's kind of like, hello! <laughs> We've come to see your world! We're not from your planet! <laughs> and it's all a bit odd, to be honest. I mean, they say things like, they're making contact with her because, in their experience, scientists are less resistant. Now, that's logical. If you're going to, particularly if when they're making first contact with species developing warp drive, given that it's supposed to be to take you to the outer regions of space, it is logical that the scientists developing warp drive will have considered whether or not they might encounter other races. You can see the logic there, mm. but it's still a bit odd, if you ask me. Did you find it odd? I did. Well, I mean, the only reason they're doing it at this stage is because of Riker's situation, okay. isn't it? They wouldn't have normally made contact at this particular point in, in proceedings. It's simply that because they've got Riker, they know they've lost contact with him. So that's pushed their schedule forward. So okay. it seems unnatural because it's not the natural point where this conversation will be. No, happening. I've got you. OK, fair enough. I mean, if it's anything, because, of course... In the other first contact, <laughs> yeah. we get it from the shoe being on the other foot where the Vulcans are waiting for us to develop warp technology. Yeah. So it's, it, I would say it's a repeat of that. Obviously, chronology gives a repeat of that. But in terms of the chronology of the series, first contact, the film takes this concept out of first contact, the episode, and reverses it. Basically, as soon as you become warp capable, the powers that be make contact, which yeah. makes perfect sense. As it does, say. yeah. And then... Their response is to beam Marasta Yell up. And I'm afraid I then have a fashion comment. Mm-hmm. Which is why, in Next Generation in particular, although I have to say I think it's also an issue in DS9, do so many races, regardless of what their faces look like, have the women wearing court shoes? Court shoes? They're like low heeled shoes that have a slightly pointed toe, uncomfortable. It's not very easy to walk in them. They don't make an awful lot of sense, don't look very nice. So the idea that Earth has come up with this as the idea of a fashionable shoe is bad enough, but the idea that every other bloody race in the universe, regardless (laughs) of what bumps and ridges they have on their forehead, has women wearing these things... You've lost me. I mean, I, I own one pair of shoes... Bollocks! You've got four pairs under that no, no, chair. A pair of shoes. I mean, I've got a pair of trainers as well. Oh, trainers aren't shoes now. What are no, they? Gloves? They're trainers, obviously. <laughs> Duh. Trainers are shoes. Well, I, I suppose vaguely, but I, I'm I'm thinking you're talking about smart shoes, shoe shoes. Yeah. As opposed to Things what you wear, you wear as casual on your stuff. Feet. Okay. Do we really want to get bogged down here with shoes? No. My point is just that. Dangerous, this podcast will turn out cobblers. Hey, thank you. I'm here all week. Try the veal. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> Do we have to explain cobblers to the US now? Well, that's probably not worth doing. No. <laughs> now, my point is, okay, yes, I have actually now only one pair of shoes I can't walk in. Yes, very good. The point is that <laughs> these court shoes, you can't walk in them very well. Are they called court shoes because they're what you wear to court? Or is that... I've no bloody clue. Oh, right, okay. Fine. But they're low heel. They don't look that nice. You can't argue they look lovely, but you can't walk in them. They don't look lovely, and you still can't walk in them very easily. And why does so every single pissing alien race have them? You never see. <laughs> don't look at me. <laughs> females, alien females, in the equivalent of DMs. I have a pair. So... You never have them in the equivalent of trainers. I have those too. Or wedges. I've got quite a few of those. <laughs> you never see them in boots. You no. never. Do you see what I mean? It's What's... just always fucking court shoes. It's... What's with the court shoes? I, I, I can't help you. I mean, I, certain of our listeners have certain specialisms. I, I might have pointed you in the direction of. I mean, yeah, Dimbo Sama, for instance, on the music, and, and JJ on the original series. But shoes. Okay, folks, calling out <laughs> for a Trek shoe expert at this point. <laughs> Can we move on from the shoes, please? Sorry. <laughs> they sit down in Ten Forward and Picard talks about how when a race comes to their attention, 
because of the technology they developed. They start monitoring their broadcasts, their journalism, and their popular music. And Marazziel makes a comment like, ooh, I hate to think how you've judged well, on the basis exactly, of the popular yes. music. And I thought, yeah, actually... Kind I'll... of exposes that for stupidity, yes. <laughs> yeah. But no, it's interesting because surely if they're monitoring the broadcast, maybe they get an idea whether or not they have a free press, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a certain sense in it, but you would obviously not monitor all media. You'd, you'd filter out things, you know. Stuff that isn't obviously news, for instance. Yeah, I don't know why You'd they think. monitor popular music. I don't, yeah, I don't yeah, what's know. that going to tell you? I don't know. Anyway. Oh. I'm the urban spaceman, baby. <laughs> Right, they're ready. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Considering that was what the sixties. <laughs> I know exactly. I, that, that's my point. It makes no sense. And then they say they also conduct surface reconnaissance, which is people in disguise with glasses. Oh, no. Yeah, and again, like the phaser, it's still not all that clever, is it? Really? No, it isn't. Particularly not when they're physically quite different. Yeah. And your person doing the reconnaissance has to wear gloves to cover up the fact that he hasn't got the same hands as everybody else. I mean, it's just asking for trouble, really, isn't it? And not only that... This does mean... make the Federation out to be, let's face it, rather stupid. It does, because, like, if they can give Riker facial ridges, why yeah. can't they make his hands... His hands look like... On the basis of we can make people's hands look like that with makeup, obviously, because it's a serious... Do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <sighs> anyway... Then they're talking to Marasta Yale about, you know, talking to the Prime Minister. And she's like, no. And she's like, because he'll talk to Cola. It's actually called Crowler, but in my notes, she's Cola all over. Um, talk to Cola, and Cola's got an agenda. And it's like, you know, so don't do that. And they're like, well, you know, Reich has been missing for two days and we can't find him. So then they decide, obviously, he's got to go ahead and meet the Prime Minister. And there he is, stamping documents. Yes, bit- as I'm sure Prime Ministers do, um... Probably not. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, he doesn't want to see her. And she's like, well, she's waiting outside with two visitors. And then she's like, I think you might want to clear your afternoon schedule. And um, then there's Picard. Mm-hmm. So they beam him up to the Enterprise and give him a guided tour. And then they talk about how, you know, you know, we're here to guide you. And it really is fucking patronising. <laughs> Really, I mean, I don't know whether it's supposed to be or not, but it, it comes across. That, I mean, I can understand why, because it's always useful if somebody's done something that you have, you can learn from their mistakes rather than repeating them. So I can see the logic, it's, but the way it comes across is it's patronising. It's an interesting little uh, f- f- factoid gets dropped in by Picard that the first contact that happened with the Klingons went so bad. This is why they're doing this these days, is because when they they had their first contact with Klingons, it went so badly that it caused effectively the the fallout that they're still living from a bit now. So that they now nowadays they try and make sure that they know about species well in advance. So it, it does explain why they send somebody down on the planet, but it doesn't explain why they send them down without suitable alteration. <laughs> yeah, and with a bloody face. I mean, have they not learned from who watches the watchers? Oh, apparently not. No. no. <laughs> Which they should have done. Yes. But anyway. So then the guy turns around and says, you know, this morning I was leader of the universe and now I'm just a voice in the chorus. Yeah, that's, that's a really good performance, actually. The guy who plays the chance was very good. Yeah. And I have to say, listening to him, I'm thinking, yeah, but I would much rather be a voice in the chorus than mm. have the responsibility of being leader of the universe. Mm. Well, that's he does say, and, and, now, and today was, was a good, a good day. It was a good day, yeah. yeah so. And then you, you go back to Riker in the hospital and he's come to and he wants to escape. And um, Lilith is there <laughs> as the alien groupie. Okay, Babe Neweth, I think is how you We're pronounce her We're not quite sure how yeah. you pronounce her name. She plays Linnell rather than Lil- Lilith, but the name isn't that far away, is it? Go no. On. I could divert the guard's attention. You might stand a chance if you took the service exit down the hallway to the right. To the right? Fine, let's do it. Why should I? Well, 
You know why. I don't belong here. I have to get back on my ship. In space. I believe you. Now, will you help me? If you make love to me. What? I've always wanted to make love with an alien. Listen, Miss... Lanell. Lanell. I really have to get going. All the other aliens are waiting for me. Oh, it's not so much to ask. And then I'll help you escape. <laughs> it's not that easy. There are differences in the way that my people make love. I can't wait to learn. And you can see Riker is a little bit freaked out by it. And then he goes, well, um, there are differences. <laughs> you dread to think now, don't you? And then you think, <laughs> oh, maybe they need... Big Jim Slade. Big Jim, former tight end for the Kansas City Chiefs, is outfitted with various whips, chains, and a sexual appetite that will knock your socks off. Big Jim has satisfied women throughout the world, and the capital of Nebraska is Lincoln. Yes, I think so. <laughs> and then um, she's sort of looking slightly flushed and putting her glasses back on. Yeah. Um, so you presume that Riker was successful. <laughs> Although, actually, the fact that she says there are differences did make me think of that episode of Futurama where he falls in love with a mermaid. And then he goes, no, this is all wrong. The fish bits are the wrong way round." <laughs> makes me wonder how compatible they were. Mm. Well, he's not lo- walking with a limp afterwards, at least. So No. <laughs> no, this is true. And then he, he does try to escape, but then he's ganged up on by the guy who, from the start, has looked shifty, obviously had an agenda and belongs to the Malkorian equivalent of the English Defence League. Yeah, the shifty McShifty son, yes. So he gets the crap beaten out of him. Mm. And then that gets drawn to the attention of Cola. And then the whole thing just spirals out of control. And then Picard is left basically with egg on his face, isn't he? Going... Yes, because the, 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 basically the Chancellor finds out that there's already been an alien. And why Picard didn't tell him, I do not know. I mean, he says, Rasta Yale told me not to tell you. But it's like, clearly that was a really, really stupid call. I mean, it not only does the Federation look stupid, but actually Picard looks pretty stupid. Because surely he must have known it was going to come out at some point. Far better to be out up front about it. Yeah, because he's been missing for two days. You can understand if they yeah. didn't know. I mean, even so, just, you know, stupid. Very stupid. Yeah, no, I mean, if they didn't know he'd been captured... It's a really good concept, this story, but it, it is really marred by the fact that the Federation and Picard just act stupidly they all do. the way through, don't they? Because, you know, you've got this conversation with the Chancellor and Picard where he's going... Okay, I can understand that. Yeah, I kind of like. Yeah, they reach they reach an understanding, and I'm sure if Picard had said to him at that point, "Look, one of the things we do is we we try, we try and do research. Let's face yeah. it, a logical thing to do. So we do send to the, and as it happens, we have a crew. You know, well, that's what he says. He wouldn't full, know, he wouldn't have full panicked. disclosure at the point of contact would have been yeah. advisable, oh, dear, and it's dear. like yes, it would have been Picard. You're an idiot. Stupid, this guy is being stupid completely, man. completely reasonable. Yeah. So then you have the the situation where they're trying to find out his location, and then Cola is saying, you know, revive him so I can interrogate him. And the doctor is going, no, I took an oath to do no harm. Reviving him, could he's another good him. character, isn't he? he yeah. Is could could do Some that. Really good acting in this. Really um, good acting. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do it. He's like, well, you'll be relieved then. So then he's um, relieved by English Defence League guy. <laughs> Who, of course, revives him. And then he's like, I know who you are. I know what you're here for, whatever. And then he tries to f- to commit suicide, but by making Riker... Make it look like Riker shot him, yeah. Yeah, but Riker manages to get to the phaser in time to change it to stun setting. Mm. Well, it was on stun setting anyway, because when the guy fired it, the security guy, it just knocked a stand over. Yeah, it didn't true. disintegrate or anything. It. So true. therefore, it was, it was always going to be on a low setting. setting. Yeah, Not like against Utah Saints. Yes, quite. Done. Yeah, if it had been Riker's normal phase setting, he would have been screwed, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, right, no, he would have been right to begin with, because it wouldn't have stopped him to begin with. But if he'd fired at himself four more times, then he would have disintegrated. Yeah, he yeah. sort of went one, two, death. Yes, I did one, two, and pfft, gone. Yeah. <laughs> then Crusher beams down, and she manages to save both of them, but Riker was right to the wire. Mm-hmm. Presumably because he'd been forcibly revived. Yeah. And the Prime Minister is like, you know, greets Cola and says... And he's like, we can't do it, we can't do it. And he's like, I know. 
And then he says to me, Carl, he said, you said if we didn't want you here, you know, you'd leave. Well, I'm asking you to leave. And the thing is, what he says is completely makes sense. Mm. And actually, it, make, it just makes the Federation look stupid because mm. this is a society that thought they were the centre of the universe. Mm. But their technology is more developed than ours now. And there are an awful lot of people on Earth now for whom the existence of life on anywhere other than Earth threatens their world view. And it just makes me think, how stupid is the Federation? Mm. They shouldn't have been there. They shouldn't yeah. be doing anything. Because, OK, technologically, this society might be ready, but surely you should realise by now that in terms of their society and their ideology, they're no Bad time, near. bad time, yeah. It's not right. Mm. So the Prime Minister's completely right. Mm. But it is interesting that Marastio asked to stay on board mm. just give permission but we never hear from her again which is a bit of a bummer because mm. I would quite like to know what happened to her yeah what did she do she's a scientist did she go to a science station somewhere did she carry on exploring you know I just it would be nice to know really it's a good story in that being told from the other point of mm. view is good yep. there is some really good acting in it mm-hmm. really really good the alien culture is really well do Realised? Realised, that's yeah. the word I was looking for, thank you. So, yes, okay, they're just bumpy head aliens again, to an extent. But actually, you get to see quite a bit their world, yeah. or at least their hospitals anyway, and also the Prime Minister, uh, the Chancellor's office and stuff. It, it all, it's really well designed. It's believable, isn't it's it? It's believable. You can buy it. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's good stuff, yeah. It is, it's just that the Federation... Look not, like plonkers. They do! Yep, Okay. <laughs> Should we find out what other people thought of it? Yes, please. Uh, we have some feedback from The Mark. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Not The Mark of the Rano, that's Dot Two. Just seen First Contact for the first time in years. A great episode to invert the classic First Contact thing. We know the crew are the good guys, the locals don't. Fun concept. However, this one has a flaw and it is huge. So big, in fact, that it spoils the whole thing. The sexual abuse of Riker by the nurse played by Babe Neweth. So from Wiki, he quotes, Riker attempts escape with the help of a nurse who reveals to Riker a longing to bond with an alien. Riker accepts her offer, and it's played for laughs. OK, let us respin this. Troy attempts escape with the help of a doctor who reveals to Troy his longing to have sex with an alien. Troy accepts her offer, and it's played for laughs. Now, with a woman in the role, it's kind of going towards rape. It's survival sex, and that's considered to be a form of prostitution engaged in by people in extreme need. And it's never brought up again. It's a double standard. Yeah. Young me found it funny. Current me found it disturbing. But it bugs me like crazy. Oh, thank you, Mark. I think... Given... Any other character, <laughs> other than right, Ken, you would be right. No, yeah, <laughs> even then, that in rape cases, it doesn't matter how promiscuous the victim is, that's mm. irrelevant, you're allowed to say no. Yeah. He looks uncomfortable. He does not look like a man giving consent. Mm-hmm. Does he? Um, there, well, he raises the anatomy There are point. differences. Yeah, yes. and it does, uh, this is the big <laughs> the thing that leaves hanging is, okay, so what did that involve? <laughs> and, and now, oy, oy, oy. <laughs> my brain goes to Ivanova Place. Right. Boom shakalaka boom shakalaka <laughs> That's the route you should have taken. And if you don't know what that's a reference to, you really need to see Babylon 5. Because, you do. Yeah, she's not going to know, is she? Oh, that would be so awesome if that's what Riker did. <laughs> so that does that would have turned it round a bit. <laughs> I mean, yes, uh, she on the other foot. Yes, I'll let you escape, but you have to have sex with me is really unpleasant. Yeah, it is actually rather than funny. But it's Riker, so <laughs> it's like that was possibly what he had in mind anyway. I don't know. I, had it been any other character, it would have been. It would have felt uncomfortable. But because it's Riker, it doesn't for some reason. And I think that that probably says volumes about Riker, doesn't it? Really. <laughs> Whereas for me. Saying it's Riker doesn't work. Uh huh. Well, we are. But the whole boom shakalaka thing does. <laughs> I, I just think he improvises. So, in other words, uh, this is how we make love. And he sticks her finger in his in her ear and goes, tweaks it about, says, There you go. How, how good was it for you? And she's or, not going to know any different. Or it's Umax or something. You just. Yes. Do you know what I mean? That's it's quite. I get rounded by thinking that he, he, he is someone, a character who thinks on his feet. Yeah, yeah. And he found a way round it. But they did no, need to show that then, really, didn't they? Even yeah. though it wasn't. Wouldn't have been particularly... But if they'd done it like Babylon 5, all would have been well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just the fact that it's Riker doesn't justify yeah. it. Okay, we've got some MP3 feedback as well. Okay. So let's hear from Wayne Peters. 
Hello Orgs, so it's First Contact or Star Trek does the X-Files. I can't remember if this predates the X-Files or whether it was in full swing at the time. I seem to recall uh, there was quite a, a fad for um, government conspiracies and cover-ups and UFOs and Roswell at the time. It was the in thing. I guess it's, uh, it's no surprise that Star Trek decided to do its own little twist on it. According to the, uh, the Next Generation Companion, this was a third season script that got... Uh, they got passed around to several writers and got quite a few rewrites. And it did change quite considerably. One version it was meant to be uh, a season finale where Wesley would actually uh, stay planet side and leave the show. Another one had the, the crew of the Enterprise becoming celebrities amongst the, uh, the native population. It's quite nice. I do like this one. I like the idea of the, the society that's on the verge of developing a warp drive. The idea of it is quite exciting. I remember being quite excited when I first heard of the Alcubierre drive, the, uh, the the sort of real world, I suppose, sort of warp drive that's being bandied about by various scientists. I think the science on that is all still a bit wibbly wobbly, but uh, but it, it's exciting. The idea that it could be a possibility uh, is quite exciting, and of course the idea that once we develop faster than light propulsion system that will take us to other stars the idea that there would actually be new life and new civilizations when we get there is is quite exciting as well so this episode appeals on on a couple of levels really something that uh, i thought was a bit odd was they chose a random scientist and then just beamed down and said hi we're from outer space it all felt very low key i'm not sure if we were to visit other civilizations at other stars that we would contact them in quite the same way. It was just seemed an unusual way of approaching it. And the resolution's very sort of downbeat as well and very kind of feels a little too paranoid and isolationist. I think I can't help feeling that they would welcome the the Federation, but cautiously, not just simply shut their doors and say, we'll have none of that here. I felt a little extreme. So altogether, not a classic, but a gentle and enjoyable romp. And, uh, and I, I really quite enjoyed it. So a thumbs up for uh, First Contact, I think. Yeah, I'm not sure it's none of that right here exactly. I think it's none of that just yet. We're yeah. not ready, I think, is really what they came to. It's the too, end. Soon, too soon rather yeah. than no. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a not yet. Yeah. We're not ready yet. And as for the X-Files, that didn't start till 93. Good and Lord. we think this aired in about 1990 US, so it would have been probably 91 UK, at a guess. Yeah, this aired in the US in, in 91, so it predates the X-Files by a couple of years. Yeah. So they weren't being influenced by the X-Files. Whether the other inverse is true, I'm not sure, but there we go. Very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, let's hear from Murray the Pie Man. Hello, Orcs. It's Murray the Pie Man here again, um, talking to you about First Contact. Uh, this is an episode I really rather liked. I think it's possibly going to be a theme in the two episodes we cover this cast, that uh, I like the concept as much as anything else. Um, first Contact, I really like to see how the Federation goes about a First Contact mission. You know, they know they've been watching from a distance, they know the society is about to become more capable, and so they've got uh, people on the, well, a person on the planet in disguise, although they did the surgical alterations to the face. I really wish they'd given him something more than mittens to hide his fingers, but uh, you know you can only go so far, clearly. Um, and uh, yes, we, we, I quite like that little insight into, again, things the starships do. Um, and then, of course, we have... It all goes wrong, Riker's captured, and uh, I just... I like seeing the Federation. We don't quite see it from the outside, but I did like this idea of our culture, how they might see a big, very grand race of space-faring beings coming to their planet. It's a, it's, it's a really nice idea, and I actually thought it was very well executed. So, um, And, you know, obviously there's a the little adventure of Riker on the planet, trying to escape, etc., etc. Um, I don't think they ever talk about uh, dissecting him, which, which is nice. Uh, they're obviously a bit more pleasant than we are. Um, uh, if you look at the episode of Little Green Men, not just a general statement of people liking dissecting stuff. And, yes, so, overall... Um, it it was a, a perfectly uh, perfectly adequate episode, um, and yes, as I say, I, I quite like it. I probably put it into the good territory because I quite like the way it does have this view of the outside and the fear that we're conquering. And indeed, at the end, in a rather unexpected ending, that they decide, no, we don't want to make contact with the Federation just yet. We we want to wait for a bit and see what happens. 
I thought that was pretty cool. You you would have honestly expected um, the episode to end with them, you know, with another ship. I mean, that about that's about the only thing I would have almost expected the Federation to have specialised people for this rather than just sending a general starship. But I suppose the Enterprise is big enough that it would have specialists. And again, if they had specialists, why send? But these are kind of little niggles that you kind of think just because yes, obviously, if this was about the starship, something or other going to this mysterious planet to um, you know to to make first contact, we wouldn't see it because we'd be following the Enterprise. So that's fair enough. Um, on a wee final note, you did mention Bits and Bobs last week. Um, yes, I do remember that. It still goes around on CBBS. And thanks to that, you had the little, we're trogging along, we don't know where we're going, song stuck in my head. So thanks for that. But uh, anyway, I will talk to you with hopefully less small singing bits uh, about Galaxy Child next. Okay, until then, bye. <laughs> <laughs> we are the kings of the earworm, aren't we? we? Are. <laughs> yes. Sorry, Marie. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, yes, I, it, it, as he says, it, it has a, a charm about it. This yeah, episode, it does. I think, it, it's certainly very clever the way that they, they do it from the perspective of the uh, the alien race rather than the Federation's perspective. And and yes, I'm I'm with you on on the fact that the the ending fits nicely, and it's kind of a surprise because you normally expect these things to be tied up you quite do, very neatly. But it fits. But it fits completely with the the characters that you've been presented with in the episode. So, other than the slight awkwardness about <laughs> about the uh, Sex to escape. Yes. <laughs> Press sex to escape. <laughs> is that never an adventure? It probably is in adventure games, isn't it? Just not the sort I've ever played. Um, <laughs> um, other than that, it was a really good story, I thought. Yeah. Very enjoyable. Yes. Okay, shall we move on to Galaxy's Child? Stingray! Stingray! Deadly encounter with a strange life form. It is moving directly toward the ship. Evasive maneuvers. And suddenly the Enterprise becomes its prey. Whenever we try, Junior responds by sucking up more energy. Now the crew's trapped in its death grip. How long before the power drain becomes critical, Mr. LaVord? Captain, just a little more time. 30 seconds to intercept. Red alert. All decks go to emergency level 7. Alien Crisis on the next exciting episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Okay, question. Yes? This all decks go to emergency level 7? Mm-hmm. I've never come across that no. before. Maybe it's just me. No, but it's I'm you not... and me as well. I'm like, okay, so level 7 on a scale of what? 7 on a scale of 10, 15, 20? How no, do I... Have I have no idea. No idea on that front. But, the... but that's really what strikes you about that trailer. Sorry, yes. <laughs> the fact that... There is absolutely no mention of Leah Brobs at all when that's two thirds of the plot, really. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, talk about miss selling. I mean, basically, it focuses on the B plot, that trailer, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Uh, but exclusively. It's just, absolutely it's just exclusively. that, unfortunately, the moment they said emergency level seven, I'm like, the what now? Wait, right. What's that? Where? What? Okay, How? They, and then. They, they distracted you with their shiny lights and. Sorry, yes. <laughs> My bad. I'm sorry. Shall we deal with that bit of the plot first, though? What, the level 7 bit? No, the bloody stingray bit. Stingray! Stingray! So the Enterprise detects an anomaly which turns out to be our space stingray, and uh, it's realised by a combination of fibreglass model and CGI, so it looks quite cool. I mean, this is very early CGI, yeah. CGI, so it looks a bit ropey, but... To be honest, I can pull up with that. I remember being very impressed with it when I originally saw it, and it's a product of its times. Well, yeah, it is, because it looks like the sort of thing Babylon 5 might have done, and it's contemporary, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, no, no, not a bad effect. Um, we also get Ensign Rager at the con, uh, de- debuting, and she'll return it, uh, Night Terrors, which is coming up soon. Also Relics, it's a great one with Scotty. Yeah. And it's nice that they have these reoccurring con characters it now, is. so that there's a sort of rotation, which is quite good. The Stingray creature zaps them with green. Yeah. Why green again? It's, it's always always with the green. 
they think it's a pro, but it starts affecting their systems and the radiation levels start to rise. They try and sort of flick it off with a low power phaser beam, but unfortunately manage to kill it. Which is inadvertent. Yes. But... Yeah. And a, a depressed Picard goes to leave the bridge, but it's revealed the stingray has still got life in it, and it turns out it was pregnant, hence its hostility. So Dr. Crusher points out that the because the offspring was premature it might not be able to escape so then they have to do an emergency cesarean with the phases which goes ahead and uh, they give birth to a large baby something as she puts it as the enterprise starts to leave the baby follows it's now as troy points out imprinted on them well, uh, it's logical exactly and the, the baby latches on and starts draining energy from the ship's reactors he's feeding and it gives them basically seven hours power left the idea is they're going to try and get ditch their uh, unwanted passenger by opening the sh- one of the shuttle bays which it's over and the uh, depressurization will just spring it off opening the pod bay ba- doors howl doesn't work and the power drain if anything increases data determines that the mom was on its way to an asteroid belt and uh, they try scanning it but it interferes with their scanners uh, but they can they can tell that the asteroids have a suitable sustenance for the baby so they they set course for here hoping that they'll be able to get the baby to go and leave and and mong on a bunch of asteroids as they arrive as a bunch of the creatures start approaching but they've only got a a few seconds power left so they won't be able to defend themselves and that's when Leia Brahms latches on to the idea of souring the baby's milk. Which is about the only thing I remember of the episode other than the scene yep. thing, uh, souring the milk. Which is that, you know, the, the, the classic way of you know, explaining your problem by using a suitable analogy. Yep. And uh, it takes a little while to get the, the energy signature to, to be low enough for the baby to not want the milk anymore. But they manage it in the end. And there's a very cheesy good work moment between Geordie and there Leia Brahms. Yeah. That is not the worst element of the episode Ooh, by far. Oh, no, 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 And no. taken just as that, it would be kind of a nice, interesting episode. It's a nice concept. Yeah. And um, the whole idea of a spacefaring creature is really... Space whales is good. Space whales are always good, aren't they? Yep. So, you know, give that bit of the plot, you can see why they focused on it in the trailer, because the rest of it is awkward. Just a bit. Incredibly awkward. Because Leia Brahms arrives, having already appeared in Booby Trap on the holodeck. Booby. Boobies. Uh, recreated by Geordie and then uh, him getting slightly too attached to it. Uh, well, now she's I- here in person in her 80s power suit. Oh, yeah, oh, horrible silver. Bad. Oh, it's horrible. And uh, Geordie's all excited and he's talking to Guinan. And he has this person that I've made this contact with. And Guinan's like... <laughs> You yeah, strange right. yeah. bugger. <laughs> and he says, yeah, I've studied her schematics for years. It's like, mm, yes. And that kind of sets the tone of creepiness. She beams aboard and immediately she's criticising everything, every change he's made. And he's like, well, you know, practically speaking, you have to make changes. All we are looking at on a, a drawing board. But when you're you know, here in the field, you do have to make some changes. But it's a real sort of slap to his face, really. And, I mean, she does arrive looking like she's been sucking lemons for Oh, years. she does. I mean, she's bad. Way, way too ad- adversarial to start with. And, it, the, you know, she she knows enough about engineering, clearly, to have designed this thing, to have known that, you know, the way things happen in practical yeah. reality means you have to change things. I mean, it's just a completely stupid concept that she gets so annoyed about the fact that he's changed a few things. Dumb. Absolutely dumb. At one point, she discovers that one of the engine changes he's made was planned for future designs of a galaxy class ship so how did he know that mm, we wonder mm. and to allay her suspicions geordie invites her on a dinner date of fungili whatever heck that I is i don't know what it is but if it's but it any sounds dodgy doesn't it of his fucking jumper oh, oh well this is it so she oh. turns up for, for this meal and uh, he's he's decided he's pulled out all the stops he's turned the the lighting down to sexy he's put the sexy make out music on and he's dressed in his best sexy make out jumper which is awful. <laughs> Absolutely bloody Look at my awful. my velour jumper. <laughs> oh, it's awful. Really, really oh, bad. Oh, it's terrible. Oh, and his lecherness just keeps coming out in the conversation. Rather than telling her the truth, he just keeps oh, bungling just his way through it. Oh, call me Geordie. So fuck off, you idiot. You absolute complete wonk. And Why he... she doesn't call him out on his creepiness is just completely Or just his me. jumper. And, and point out, I mean, way, way before she eventually tells him that she's yeah, married. Just... She should have pointed that a lot. I mean, why the fact they don't have wedding rings in the 24th century because this is proving that they're much yeah. needed. 
Oh dear, oh dear. There was one nice bit where they, they crawl down Jeffrey's tubes together, and these are proper Jeffrey's tubes. Yep. Unfortunately, they're dressed in chock block outfits as they do it. They are a bit, yeah. <sighs> Never mind. But yes, unlike in The Hunted when Jeffrey tubes were corridors, these are proper, proper cramped tube, up. Cramped tubes, yeah. And he gets a bit of praise for his modifications at this point, and it, things seem to have got to a norm, more normal state of affairs between them. Uh, but she's still suspicious how much he knows about her, and, and he says he studied her. Mm. Mm. admired her big balls work you yeah. it's just stalker stalker and Bad eventually that's stalker. the point when she eventually breaks it to him that she's married and it's like the look on his face oh, you stupid idiot and he goes moaning to Guinan about it and it's like well you know is it any surprise that your fancy woman doesn't lift up live up to your expectations by this point, she's wearing a much better purple dress, Woo-hoo! which Amory immediately perked up at. Yes. <laughs> they've, got, they've got this problem with the baby attached, so she calls up the engine specs and finds out that there's a very helpful holographic simulation she can use. Yeah. That Geordie should damn well have password Deleted. protected, yeah, at least. Or something. If not, did he? But can you not password protect things in this century? Stupid, stupid. So off she goes, and then when in, when Geordie's deputy tells Geordie where she's gone to, he's like, ah, ah, so off he runs. There's a comedy run as he walks in on her. Yeah, she's uh, found his porn. Yeah. And she's understandably outraged at this point. I yeah. Mean, it, uh, her level Whenever of hostility. you touch these engines, yeah, yeah. you're the, the level of hostility me. before was a bit unrealistic. At this point, it's perfectly entirely realistic, realistic. Because she's found out just how creepy he is. I'm with you every day, Geordie. Every time you look at this engine, you're looking at me. Every time you touch it, it's me. Computer freeze program. Now, I understand. No, you don't. It's not the way this may look. I called up a replay of the program file. I was all ready to compliment you again, Commander, for constructing a program which contained the prototype engine so that you would always have a baseline reference for your modifications. And now I find that it's all about a fantasy plaything. It's not like that. I swear. I'm outraged by this. I have been invaded, violated. How dare you use me like this? How far did it go, anyway? Was it good for you? Nothing like that happened. It was a professional collaboration. Oh, I can tell. Every time you're touching the engine, you're touching me, real professional. Look, if you watched the whole program, you saw what it was. We were working together to solve a problem in a crisis situation. How do I know how far it went? How many other programs did you create? Perhaps dozens of them, one for every day of the week, one for every mood. Yes. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Uh, fantasy playthings. Mm. Jordy tries to defend himself on the basis that she's being unfriendly. You know, I tried to reach out to you. Well, if this is your example of reaching out to somebody, recreating them on the holodeck, and clearly having a slightly inappropriate relationship with said recreation, then it's understandable that she's creeped out yep. by you, idiot, and doesn't want to be friendly. Good grief. Feeble, feeble man. But then they end up coming up with this solution together to sour the milk, to get rid of the baby. And bizarrely, by the end, they're giggling over a drink at Tanford and they've all made up, despite how creepy Geordie has been all along. So it just doesn't work at all. <laughs> Horrible. And I like Geordie generally as a character, but in this, he's just so creepy and awkward that you can't help but hate the poor guy. And yeah, I know. feel sorry for LeVar Burton having to act this out, because... It's it's a thankless task, the very yeah. definition of a thankless task. But I agree with you. I mean, surely his holiday whatnot should be password protected. protected. It's a very we can do it with documents in this day and age. Why can't they do it? In no, they should be because she shouldn't have been able to discover that. That's not. <sighs> you can argue all you want that him creating that was inappropriate, but so, at the end of the day, technology existed for him to do it. Yeah. So therefore, if he hadn't done it, somebody so else would have done. So you've got Leia Brahms being off-puttingly abrasive to start with. Yeah. And then you've got Commander Lech from Geordie all oh. the way through. It's nice; it's got more to do, but not in this way, really. With that jumper, I just can't that get jumper, that jumper yeah. out of my head. It's awful, it's, and that, bloody and awful. Whilst the B plot's okay, the, the the A plot is so awkward; it's very, very hard to watch. 
It's a very uncomfortable it is. watch, isn't it? Yeah, I spent quite a lot Which, of time on And Twitter. ultimately, it doesn't work on an emotional level because you can't believe for a minute she'd be sat with him in 10 forward after all. Even having solved the problem together, that would have been like, we have a professional relationship, we work together when we need to, that's the end of it, you yeah, creepy, no, right. creepy, yeah, creepy like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can, I can get that. We, we will have a professional relationship Yeah. because that's what we are and humanity is better now than it used to be. Yeah, and all the rest yeah, of it, yeah. we can work together despite your creepiness, but I'm not having anything to do with your no, social level. It. Oh, no, just... I get that. Oh. No, you, she shouldn't be just chatting <laughs> with him in, in ten forward. So this this really does not work. He's broke. <laughs> hey ho, shall we find out what other people thought? Yeah. Uh, do you want to read out the marks feedback? Okay, the mark says, "Oh, poor Geordie." Poor Geordie. Did no one tell you to hide your holodeck computer simulated porn that you made of the woman you've fallen for when she comes to see you and find out she's married? It's like not letting the ex meet the girlfriend times a million. (laughs) Blood metaphor. But don't worry, the episode is full of them. Just be glad Mm -hmm. you didn't fire up Brahms 72 or Brahms 86. Mm. It's also a good (laughs) callback to the booby trap from last year. The booby trap is not another of Geordie's holiday programs. <laughs> Are you sure, Mark? Are you sure? Are you sure? I think that's Leo Brahms number 42, isn't it? Oh, dear. <laughs> Life, the universe, and everything. Yes, all in a booby trap. Yes. Oh, dear. All joking aside, is it invading her privacy? Yes. Or is it misuse of a person's image? And is yes. he wrong for doing it? Both. Um Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Any more than I am for having dirty thoughts about the Duras sisters. Well, there's, there's dirty thoughts and then there's being able to recreate 3D yeah. replications of the Duras sisters and potentially do very unsafe things yeah. to them. I think that the actresses might have a word to do, yeah. or two to say about how their image is being used, but there we go. Yeah, OK, it's at the writing porn fanfic stage. <laughs> Susan Gibney, underrated here as both real and pissed off Leah, as well as fake sexy Leah. <laughs> mm. I find it interesting that fake Leah gives us a look into LaForge's mind and the type of woman he wants, and he's mm. not going to find one on the flagship of the fleet. This is more important than wacky CGI alien of the week sucking on the Enterprise's power. At the end, LaForge and Brands put aside their issues and devise <laughs> technobabble. Or should that be tissues? <laughs> 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 and devise Technobabble with a metaphor sour the milk to get rid of wacky CGI alien of the week. I do wonder if Geordie would be happier off the ship and settled down. Um, probably not actually, because the engineering side is the only bit that's going right for him. I can't yeah. imagine him being settled down particularly, but there we are. No, but the thing is, though, you can be settled down on the Enterprise, can't exactly, you? Exactly. Yeah. Would you not be happy? He'd be happier with a non-creepy relationship, I think. Well, hopefully he's learnt this lesson. <laughs> the thing is, there's all the callback to the whole Barclay thing. Or indeed, if we're going to point the finger, Riker and and you haven't seen this episode in ages, but uh, and what's the name, Minuet? Yeah. And one one oh one 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 one. That was a little bit dad dodgy as well. Uh, although at least that was a you know sort of not a recreation of somebody in particular it was a you know a randomly generated image whereas yes Barclay was recreating crew members to yeah. do unfortunate things with their images um yeah. and um this is just another example and there was that moment when Barclay and Geordie sat down it's and Geordie says well you know we've all taken things a bit too far occasionally on the Alder deck and you're sat there stroking your chin and going mm. so um yes this is just uh, the next progression of it all isn't it to him and Christy after that John Doe bloke zapped him with that thing. Yeah, because suddenly he was going well, things were going well with him, weren't yeah. they? But she gets completely forgotten at this point. So, yeah. yeah. It's sad, isn't it? Mm, never hear of her again. Oh. Yeah, transfigurations. You think he's, he's got it all together and suddenly he hasn't. Obviously the John Doe-ness faded and he went back to being his creepy holodeck self. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, let's find out what other people think on the old MP3s. Let's start with Mr. Murray. 
Hello again, orgs, and uh, this is Murray the Pyman back to talk to you about Galaxy's Child. Um, as I said in the previous uh, feedback, uh, this is an episode that, if nothing else, I love for its concept. Uh, more so the idea of the uh, space-faring creatures. Um, I really just love that idea, the, the creatures that live in space and feed off energy, etc., etc. Um, a really nice little concept to frame the whole thing around, uh, the whole sort of purpose of the episode around, and I quite like the sort of almost humanitarian nature of the Enterprise, that they accidentally kill the mother and have to kind of lead the, the child to the to, to the colony. Um, so yes, and, and indeed the fact that there might be, it could be so intelligent we can't understand it, or it could just be effectively space cows, but either way I, I did love, I love those big space species things. Um, and of course we had, what, that's really almost the subplot, or the, the framing device to get the plot going. Uh, the plot is that uh, Jordy finally meets Leah Brahms. Now this made me think, uh, jordy has been making up some, shall we say, suspect uh, holodeck programs uh, featuring a, a live, not just a a, per, a person who existed, but a living person. Now, you can think that people might use the holodeck for doing things other than reenacting Sherlock Holmes novels, um, or that sort of thing, or riding horses, or having snowball fights. Um, let's face it, we all know that there would be people who would go into the holodecks deliberately to, <clears throat> um, yes, have adult relations, and. Um, but you think there would be some sort of lock. I know there was an episode of Deep Space Nine where they were having a lot of trouble because someone wanted a holodeck program featuring Kira. Um, and they had a lot of trouble with that. But uh, you'd think there would be some sort of lock to stop you making up someone living. And, you know, some of, otherwise, would it just be celebrities of the era? Or would it just be, you know, you get knocked back by someone on the ship and you think, well, I'm going to do it anyway and just go to the holodeck and recreate the person. It, It's a very iffy moral territory. But, uh, yes, Geordie gets what's effectively his porn stash found by the woman featuring all of his porn stash uh, and things become uncomfortable, which is, uh, apart from that sort of <laughs> rather glib way of seeing it, it is quite a nice idea that he meets his hero and she is not as she is in the holodeck programmes and... But the way they do start bonding, and it's nice with this idea that, yes, uh, Geordi is a, a physical engineer while she is more theoretical, and she gets annoyed about the way he does You know, it's it's things like that are nice, um, and like I say, in the whole framing device of the space-faring creature and the ultimate souring the milk solution is really nice. So, uh, yeah, overall, these are two very good episodes. Well, maybe not, but, you know, as I say, we're not in the, the, still the top class, but they're very enjoyable episodes. They've got some nice, interesting concepts, but there's nice, meaty sci-fi involved in there, so... Overall, yes, these are these are much better quality than uh, the, the previous two. Um, so, as always, I will, again, say keep up the good work. Uh, very enjoying the podcast and very enjoying... Oh, dear. Grammar's gone. That's question time for you. Enjoying the podcast and I will hopefully... Um, I will feedback for the next two episodes. So, until then, goodbye. Goodbye! Thank you, sir. Yes, if he, I think, probably covers yep. it quite nicely, doesn't he? <laughs> Ought to have a look. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think, yes, because the poem was getting out there, I think both these episodes are good concepts. Yeah. The realisation is somewhat lacking in both of them, I think it's fair to say. I mean, the concept in this one of the alien baby is really good, but the way they decide to go about showing you that story involving Leia Brahms is, yeah. not And Geordie being a tonk. <laughs> Poor chap. <laughs> Okay, and uh, we'll find out what Wayne Peters has to say about it. So, Galaxy's Child. The Enterprise's mother comes on board whilst the Enterprise itself adopts a child of its own. At least, I think that's the way the story was meant to be set up. Not much of a story in this one. It's quite simple. I guess the standout element for this one is Junior, which is apparently the first use of CGI in Star Trek. Certainly the first use of CGI to create a creature. And it really is quite impressive. It still stands up today. In fact, it's so impressive that I found it hard to believe it was actually computer-generated. I assumed it was a model that had had some computer-generated jiggery-pokery applied to it to make it move about. The reason being that the the lighting and the surfaces on it are better, far better than I would have expected from computer-generated imaging of the time. Sure, Jurassic Park had come out the year before. Toy Story was due to come out a year later. But Babylon 5 started about the same time as this. So you, you've got a comparison there of a TV budget and a TV schedule to produce this kind of stuff. And certainly the technology was far more limited back then. So I really am quite impressed with Junior. I'm surprised how good it actually is. 
other things in my notes. Um, why is Geordie so crap at women? Not even relationships, just women. Uh, he is just unbelievably inept to the point where I just, I really feel sorry for the guy. He's a superb engineer. He just doesn't have a clue when it comes to the ladies. The other notes I have is that uh, according to the Next Generation Companion, this is the first time in the Next Generation that we see the proper Jeffrey's tubes, the ones that you climb inside. Apparently we've not seen those before. I did wonder why engineering uh, a lot of the time seems to be empty. Quite often it seems to be only Geordie down there. I mean, even a night shift I'd expect to see a, quite a few crew members all doing their jobs around there. And the other thing that uh, surprised me was the way that they're able to open the dilithium crystal chamber and stare at the crystals. I would have thought that the fact that they spend 24 hours a day channeling this unbelievable amount of power would meant they would be giving off just an incredible amount of radiation. And the fact that they could just open a drawer and have a look at them without any kind of protective clothing is just extraordinary. So, I like Galaxy's Child. Junior aside, there's not much to it. But uh, I suppose, like um, First Contact, not a classic, but uh, an enjoyable and, I suppose, inoffensive 45 minutes. So, uh, a thumbs up as well for Galaxy's Child, I think. The point about there not being many people in engineering is very well made. I mean, yeah. particularly that struck me with this one. There were only two extras. Well, one of them was a speaking part, and then there was one other extra, plus Geordie, plus Slayer at one point in engineering, which doesn't seem like anywhere near enough no, people doesn't. in such a big space. So, um, yes, good point. And, yes, sometimes the alien was a model. There was a fiberglass model. Basically, all the long shots were models. Uh, it's only when you got close-ups, particularly, obviously, with the baby being born, there was no way of doing that as a model. So that was CGI. And when it's on the shuttle bay, that's a CGI thing as well. And to be honest, it is a little more obvious then that you're dealing with computer graphics. Whereas the long shots look great because, well, they are models, actually. Yeah. So that's why they look as good as they do. So there we go. But everybody else seems a little more forgiving of Geordie's creepiness than we are. But yeah. I just, for me, it's 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 not just that he's hopeless with women because I mean I've always been hopeless with women. There's the difference between hope being hopeless with women on the one hand and being creepy stalkerish about women, which yeah. Geordie really is straying onto in this in this episode. episode he is. So um, yes. Okay. Well, next time we will be covering the second of next time's episodes. Recording on Tuesday, the 11th of June, deals with Geordie as well. Oh, um, it's one of our vague memories of, but I can't remember if it was any good or not. Identity Crisis, where Geordie ends up as a sort of space lizardy guy. That doesn't sound good. No, but I seem to remember it being rather clever, but maybe I'm wrong. And uh, before that, we'll be dealing with Night Terrors. The one where they get no rim sleep. They can't sleep, and it's it's another Troy heavy one, I think. So uh-huh. there You'll we go. You'll like that one, then, won't Hopefully. you? Hopefully. <laughs> yes. We shall see. So um, if you've got any feedback on those episodes or stuff we've discussed today, then feel free to contact us by email. You can send MP3s or emails to broadcasts at geekplanetonline.com or you could look at our Tumblr pages where I try and put some pictures up on that, broadcast.tumblr.com or on the Geek Planet Online forums. There we go, folks. Take care. Cheerio. Bye. Bye. The broadcast is brought to you by those lovely purple people at Geek Planet Online. The song at the opening of this podcast was written and performed by Adam Buxton and is used with his kind permission. Against all adversity, sails home.